Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Castaway Anime. I'm Neon Manta. And I'm Crunchy Bagels. And today, we're finally wrapping up our big Made in Abyss marathon, covering the second half of season two. And man. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I got, no I follow got, up, just man. It's. It's a lot. The the the, the Maiden Abyss fans were not lying when they said this is this this is where shit gets fucked. So I want to preface the podcast with this. In the spirit of things, I have decided that for this episode of the podcast, I will partake in something truly immoral and cruel, just beyond reprehensible, impossible for most innocent souls to even conceive of, right? So on my desk right now, I have here a plate, and on that plate is a bagel. I'm eating my own kind. Oh man, you, you, you're just like the guys from Made in Abyss. <laughs> <laughs> it's well i say it's a bagel it's like 90 percent eaten because i got impatient while talking to you before the show so i just started eating <laughs> it's okay. the bagel. i'm also incredibly hungry and it was half considering just like grabbing a thing of dots pretzels not sponsored and just eating them in between talking just muting my camera just going crunch crunch i have done that in uh during a podcast before uh, I think uh, it was I the Stone Ocean one where I was eating Ritz crackers. Well, I see that you, we had multiple people to take the time off and s sneak away cheeky little bites. Uh, no, no such luck here because we got uh, we you, we got we gotta have the stomach to talk about Maiden Abyss, especially this arc. Cause fuck, dude. <laughs> And remember, if you enjoyed the podcast, please be sure to hit the like button, head on down to the comments to let us know what you think of the show, and finally, subscribe to the channel for more episodes of Castaway Anime and other videos. I will say I'm glad I didn't watch any or I didn't eat anything while consuming certain episodes of the show. Because even, uh, like, I hadn't eaten anything throughout the day yet. All I had drank was coffee. And I still felt sick to my stomach. Uh, I didn't feel, like, like physically ill. But I did go, like, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is probably the most disgusted I have been at a piece of media. And I do mean that in a good way. But it it's just... It's, it's horrifying, it's gross, it's not something I was expecting in, like, uh, the first two episodes back to Made in Abyss after, like, a month-long break. It's a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if this is a hot take. I think what happens in the movie is more fucked up. But, like, this is no less of a fucked up concept to, to be placed in front of the viewer. I think that uh, I, I would put this... Around the same level of completely fucked as Dawn of the Deep Soul, I think that Dawn of the Deep Soul does a better job at making you feel consistently horrified throughout, like, its entire runtime. Whereas here, uh, it, it's mostly just intrigue at where the plot and characters are going and the occasional, ew, why would Tsukushi put this random guy, uh, like, like, why do the charms need to be shoving hairs up some random animal's ass? And then there's the backstory, which is ten times more gross than that, and truly horrifying. And then it kind of recedes again. But I, I still say that conceptually it is about on par in terms of pure horror as Dawn of the Deep Soul. The only thing more horrifying than Made in Abyss is not subscribing to the podcast. Uh, we see the stats, viewers. All right, listen, viewers. I won't like, judge you subscribe. if you. Yeah, if I won't judge you if you don't subscribe, but I will totally judge you if you don't subscribe. So do it. 
Come on, man. After after all we've been through, to some of the viewers who have been sticking around through our most successful series, I I am very surprised at how how much our Maiden Abyss uh, marathon has taken off. I mean, hey, we gotta give the viewers what they want, and apparently that means watching one of the most horrifying shows of all time. It it is a good one though. I have I have a couple friends who watched season one and the movie, and after the movie, like they heard that season two gets worse, and they 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 tapped out. They were like, "No, we 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 straight can't." You know, I don't blame them because I I think the uh, Dawn of the Deep Soul is better viewed as a horror movie than a fantasy movie in most respects because it is so good at instilling that feeling of dread in you. And I can imagine someone watching that movie, you know, like horrible, great experience, mi like mix of the two emotions. Like it's horrifying, but you also had a great time. But then you see that the anime is 12 episodes long. And then you see that the final episode is double length. And you think to yourself, can I really been survive down this road that <laughs> Can I really survive that many more episodes of Dawn of the Deep Soul level horror and dread? And like I I feel like if the show was as consistently horrifying as the movie, that it it, it would have been a struggle, honestly. But the only parts that I kind of struggled at were the backstory, where I was like, is it going to get worse than this? Because I'm not sure how much more I can handle. Well, let's not waste any more time. Get right back into where we left off with uh, episode seven. Uh, we, it's another, another one of those long, full-length uh, flashbacks going back to the, uh, the Suicide Squad that went down into the sixth layer, meeting with the uh, interference units. And uh, we also find out that uh, the, this was a note that someone had left in the uh, the podcast for the first half of Maiden Abyss season two that uh, I questioned how they were able to use the uh, the elevator into the sixth layer without a white whistle. Um, the uh, hollow had a white whistle on them or or rather like a, a your worth stone that w is made into white whistle. So, you know, plot hole filled. I do wonder if Sakushi originally, like, just had them go down not really thinking about it, and then later was like, oh shit, oh fuck, I forgot to put the your worth stone. Uh, uh, no no harm, no foul, I ain't gonna lose yeah. sleep over it if, if that's the case. I mean, I don't really care if that's the case, it is just something I wonder. Because it would be funny if it were true. But either way, they go down into the sixth layer, and they start exploring around, you know, getting a lay of the land and whatnot. And what they realize is that, uh, and I really like the way this is set up, where it's like, there are five possible places to get water. And they start listing out all the reasons, like, okay, so this one won't work because it's guarded by this super scary monster that will literally destroy us if we even try to drink any. And these two are too hot and inhospitable, and, like, the surveyor robots can't even get close to it. The, uh, forgot to mention this, they also meet a surveyor robot and start getting, uh, like, interacting with it and getting some advice from it. Uh, they seemingly don't treat it as hostile or anything like that. They pretty quickly realize that it's not going to do anything to them. Uh, they go through all these water holes, and they realize that there is only one water hole that is available that they can get water from. And I, I remember actively thinking, like, well, why this one? I mean, it's not a plot hole if they don't cover it, but I'm just, you know, a little curious, a little prickle in the back of my mind. Uh, why wouldn't other creatures use this water hole? Why wouldn't it be guarded by a monster too? And the reason why is because said monster would have died. It's not water at all. Well, it's the it's the remains of a what was it a, a monster corpse that melted and then it just became water. Uh, well, there there was a hole above the lake in question for rainfall. Although, actually, now that I say that, this place has iron rain, so never mind. Wouldn't work like that. Uh, I th 
at least the impression I got was that it was water, but that because there was this decaying, uh, like decaying creature nearby, uh, I had somehow it. deposited eggs into it. Like maybe, I'm I'm not sure exactly how it works, but whatever the it's case, contaminated. Is, even, yeah, even if you boil it, it's still contaminated. Pretty much, which makes sense because the creatures here are already surviving extreme heat on a regular basis. So, of course, if you boil that thing, it ain't, it, it, it's just going to come off unscathed. It's just going to be like, oh, what? You're just going to boil me? Zero scratches. Not Didn't even feel a thing. So, that eventually... everyone in the village to get sick, uh, one by one including Iram Yui, who, by the way, just wanted to point, point this out as a note, um, we, we gotta give a round of applause to Saku, she went through this entire ha back half of the episodes, uh, no piss this time, we've just up, we've, I, I think, I think he's finally, he's finally graduated from piss to scat, cause everyone, including Iram Yui, just has diarrhea. Well, I mean, technically, uh, I think it's like, Mostly just the eggs that the monster had laid. Eh, no. Uh, Iram Yui very explicitly has diarrhea. Okay. Uh, so, so does everyone in the village, mind you, but, you know. And the other effect of it is that their limbs are... Uh, basically, it's difficult to describe, but, like, hardening and contorting into these weird shapes slash disintegrating... Uh, yeah, they they turn into like these weird tree like corpses. They 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 uh, grow yeah, tree -like. wood from yeah they 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 grow into like wood or like the branches of a tree. It's very very uh eldritch horror esque. Basically, uh, this disease is your worst nightmare. You don't want it ever. And but eventually, one of the dudes I'm trying to remember. I think his name was... Uh, no, that's not his name. Wazukian? Uh, the Prophet, dude. Yeah, well, yeah, Wazukian. Wazukian. That's, like, the only guy I don't have the name written down for. So Wazukian, uh, he ends up finding... I think he's the one who finds it. This sort of egg... Uh, like yeah, the, the, egg -like the Cradle gem. of Desire, also known as a wish-granting egg. Uh, and it's, like, this relic that is supposed to uh, basically grant your... Yeah, sort of grant your wishes-ish. It, like, contorts your body into a form that helps you achieve your desires. But only a child can use it. Uh, of course only a child would use it. So, like, Akihito Sakushi, the menace himself, is writing this story. You think this would be accessible to adults? You really think that well, for a second? I don't, I don't <laughs> know if like the way that it works, uh, it only like mutates uh, bodies in order to happen. I think what had happened to Iram Yui specifically is that, uh, well, what they do to her in order to cure her illness is that they uh, use the the egg on her. She takes it into her body physically by absorbing it, and uh, in doing so, hoping that whatever wish Iram Yui has like the closest in her heart that might like find a way to cure her and it does there's this kind of like haunting shot or at least one that was very unsettling for me where uh she like comes into Waco's room being like Waco look I'm all better now it doesn't hurt and her melted hand is like took on this new deformed shape yeah and she's, and she's like, just, like so standing there smiling. about it like, look, it doesn't hurt anymore. I'm, I'm all better now. It's just like her hand is like five times the length it used to be, and not recognizable as a hand anymore. It's just like a mess of just shape. It's like it's not even a shape. It's just deformed. It's like spaghetti noodles. Yeah, it, there are actually quite a few shots throughout this core of episode or this block of episodes that have stuck with me, and that certainly is one of them. It is basically meant to uh, make you feel utmost horror. And th this is slightly uh, off topic, but I just want to point this out, which is that in my notes, I have this adorable rabbit shell fucker is the cutest thing ever. I want to hug everything. Guess what happens to that cute rabbit thing? It 
yeah, in bold easy. in bold i say oh no oh no <laughs> you you fucking retard you got attached to a cute thing and made an abyss <laughs> i should have seen it coming <laughs> uh, i think me uh me uh Mianya, i think uh, that's mania? The, mania yeah i think mania has Although to be fair, Mania also did get pinched by Ma, so Got never mind. No cute thing. Out. Yeah, and no, no, no cute nothing survives. Safe here. No, nothing will survive this unscathed, if even if alive. So Iram Yui, uh, she ends up taking in the Cradle of Desire, and slowly but surely, her body begins transforming. And eventually, uh, it is worth. Uh, restating that Iram Yui, she was cast out from her village because she was unable to have children. And as it turns out, one of the desires close to her heart was to have children so that she could, you know, be accepted back into her tribe. Guess what horrible things happen now that she has this body that can achieve her desires? Well, she... It's a there's a big old there's a big old asterisk next to Iram Yui is now able to bear children. Um, in order to do so, she is first mute. I guess the egg mutated her body in such a way that it overcame her physical limitation of being unable to bear children, and so now she's able to birth these rabbit esque rabbit reminiscent babies. Uh, the problem with th these babies, though, is that, um, they have no organs for eating or drinking, so they don't live longer than, like, a day, and they, and they die super fast, and every time one dies, another is birthed in its place, or Iram Yui's become a fucking unit and pumping them out every time, like, ev oh, pretty much on a daily basis, from what I could gather. That... Okay, so it astonishes me how Akihito Sakushi is able to consistently come up with new, insanely creative, insanely messed up ways of torturing children. This poor girl has to... Basically, her, her desire is to have children. Her curse is to have a child every day that instantly dies. How do you come up with this stuff? Yeah, like, not, imagine, like, this isn't too far-fetched of a concept, like, at first, where we are right now. Uh, oh, it, like, get, it gets much worse. Well, yeah, I, I'm just saying, like, to bring it, like, back into, like, a realistic human element, that's, like, if a mother tried to, like, have a child, this is, like, if a mother tried to have a child, but, like, they either died in childbirth or, like, are born with a horrible birth defect that w prevents them from living much outside the womb but every time at least for a mother that to have to go through that pain and sorrow they have to do that like every like nine to ten months uh Ira Mew is going through this every single day and not only that but her body she's also losing more and more of her humanity as she is mutated from this like rabbit mush like pile into a rabbit mush mountain Pretty much. Uh, I think this is around the... Yeah, I think that was the moment where uh, the note I sent you of me just saying, what the fuck, like, for seven oh, lines Oh, so that was straight. before the next part. <laughs> yeah, I, that, now I want to know what the notes even look worse. like after that. <laughs> uh, I didn't spam it again, but I, I did have a note about it in all bold text, so I guess we'll get to it. Yeah, so, meanwhile, while Iram Yui is, you know, pumping out these units, uh, the rest of the village has this problem. They've all been drinking the same water, the same contaminated, uh, egg water, and, you know, it's, it's fucking them up. It's melting them down. Some of them are dying, I think. And, you, you know, they, 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 they've got no, like, more food left. They, they're out of, uh, drinkable water. Yeah, even our good buddies, Biloth and, uh, Waco are feeling the effects finally and you know it seems like everyone's just gonna be doomed it feels like we're playing the Oregon Trail and everyone's dying of dysentery except <laughs> on top of shitting themselves to death they are now also melting into tree people so you know darn ooh shucks <laughs> if only there are a way out of this it's, if only oh, some no. kind of prophet 
were able to make the hard choices in life and you know do do the dirty dude so yeah it's a dirty deed but something's got to do it and maybe it's got to be done dirt cheap you know someone's got to take action but i wonder who could that person be (laughs) and what could the action possibly be well, that person is Wazukyan, who presumably gets a a vision from, I guess, the future, or like he predicts the future. I don't. Basically. I don't think he actually does do that. I think. I think that's all just like pomp and circumstance, and it's him just being like, "Listen, like this is like this is how I foresee things happening, and like this this is like the best course of action." I don't think I he mean, can legit see the future. I I was about to say, how would he know that the babies uh, heal the sickness then? But then I just realized that, like, okay, what if he was like, we're out of food, so let's cook a baby, and then so, unintentionally realized that it also cured the sickness. So yeah, I guess it um, is possible, because I was yeah, under the but- impression that he was a prophet <laughs> just because, like, how would he know? But it, it is possible. No, so. I, I'm pretty sure this is a, I'm literally just like, throw. I had the galaxy brain moment where, uh, hey, I'm Wazukan, we're out of food, uh, Iramui is, uh, f- compared to all of us, she's doing fine, and uh, she's, you know, pumping out these babies, you know, they don't live very long, so is it so... Immor- and like they're not only do they not live long, they're like, they're not, go- we've already established that they're not going to like, live their entire life. So is it so wrong if I, Wazukan, were to take the the corpses of these babies? You know, not, sometimes not even the corpses. Maybe sometimes they're, they're better fresh while they're still living. And chop them up and cook them up and feed them to my village in order to cure them of their illness. And that is exactly what happens. And Vueko is... Not happy about it. Someone who is especially not happy about it is Bailoff, who is seemingly traumatized from the whole ordeal. He's like grabbing I... at his face, like, "How could I have done this thing? Oh no!" It was so good, though. Yeah, he Man. seems to like find it tastier than everyone else. Uh, although Vuiko also found it delicious, but uh, he seems to have I... like a uh, like that. His taste buds were vibing with... Listen, maybe maybe Joe Biden is onto something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that adrenochrome be hitting different. Uh, um, I remember, so before it got revealed that it was the babies that were eaten, uh, like, so the way this food was presented was already very off kilter and like, okay, something's up. And my old bold note is they fucking ate Iramui, didn't they? But no, it was even no, worse. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I wanted to swing back around to the, every, how everyone thinks that like, it tastes so good. I can't help but wonder if that, if that was less of like, wow, somehow Wazukan is a god tier chef and he cooked this dead baby corpse into uh, the most delicious thing I've ever eaten in my life, or more of, we have been eating, like, fucking abyss food and, you know, uh, caterpillar egg water for all this time, and now this is something that tastes like, you know, compared to, like, all food in the world, it's probably not that great, but, you know, in the moment, it's probably the most delicious thing they've ever had. Uh, there's that. Another theory I had was that so Iremui's form is ostensibly uh, to ba- basically conform to her desires. Uh, it's beyond monkey's paw, but nonetheless, it is ostensibly to uh, match her desires. And so I wonder if her desire is to... Uh, obviously, at least one of them, more than likely, is to be able to keep the group uh, alive. And so I wonder if that's part of why they taste so good. Um, I think it's just more of the the healing properties that they were able to have. Um, spe- speaking of which, I, I don't think I ever figured this out, and I know this might be jumping ahead a lot. Um, we know that Wazuken said he ended up using three eggs on Iramui. Uh, we know one of them was to have the ch- uh, the children. What were the other, the purposes of the other two? Was one of them 
One of them was to have okay. Babuta. And what was so, the third? Was the third one to be uh, become Iruburu? Uh, I'm not... I don't think the show ever specified what the third egg was for, but I know that she got it from eating, uh, like... Uh, basically, Wazikan walks into her when she's in her tree form, and that's how she gets the third egg. I'm not sure if she used that to become Iroburu. So, uh, this is an aside that might actually... Uh, it, it's sort of related to this. So, I discovered on Twitter that the Maiden Abyss Season 2 anime actually cuts out a decent amount of material from the manga. And oh, damn, really? Yeah. It doesn't feel like it in the moment, but apparently uh, the manga actually spends quite a bit longer in this arc, and I, I was seeing a bit, a bit of bit discourse. Quite a bit longer on the fetus eating. Yeah, <laughs> just capturing all the raw details on that. I Iron heard something Chef about. Abyss. I forget if it was called the Prushka War Arc or the Fapita War Arc, but some kind of war arc. I presume it's the Fapita. I'd, I'd imagine Fapita. What 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 war need be fought over Prushka at this point? She I mean the stone. one. I mean, I imagined the Prushka War arc would be the one where Rico is trapping the one monster in the village and then blows the whistle to bring Reg over. That's what I would presume any Prushka War arc would be. But I'm I'm assuming the Fabuto one, and apparently that was much longer in the manga version. And I was seeing some discourse over, like, is the anime better for cutting out fluff, or is the manga better for having all this extra detail? Well, I can't weigh in because I've not read the manga yet. Me neither, but I have seen both sides be argued, and it does make me intrigued to see what kind of content they ended up dropping from the anime. Yeah, because I've heard that uh, up until now, well, up until this point now, I've heard that the anime has been, like, very faithful to the manga. Uh, I do know that the uh, the anime version tends to drop some, like, uh, like the occasional lore dump that was in the source material that explains certain aspects of the abyss better, and I, I think like that's a fairly that consistent thing. The sa the sake of pacing. Yeah, it's kind of like how in Monogatari. Uh, never mind. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bring that show up again. Yeah, the, we, we ain't got time. I to will talk hold about back. People on a swing set or talking on a slide. We're too busy. Finding out that Soylent Green is made out of people. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I were genuinely we thought Diloff was going to be like a twist villain. I thought I thought he was going to be like the the master manipulator behind everything. No, he was a a good guy all the way to the end. Yeah, he was. I I mean, he's a real one. He was the most uh, creeped out by the prospect of eating Iram Yui's children. Oh, and by the way. In the previous podcast episode, I theorized that Faputo was Iremui, just turned into a hollow and traumatized. That was not the case. Eh, so, you were, like, kind of right. I, I was kind of right. Uh, like, 60% there. But uh, it is a little different. Yeah, it, it also, the Beloff being the most freaked uh, out of all the people in the village... Hits uh, doubly hard when we see later in a flashback that uh, Iram Yui, uh, when she considered Vueko her mom, uh, he she considered Bilof to be uh, something of a father figure to her, or at least uh, a family as qu as close as Vueko is. So it makes sense why him in particular would be just absolutely uh, not not having the best of days when he ends up eating a child. Eh, not a very fun experience, I presume. And yeah, then we... They are heading out to... Because Irem Yui... I, th I think because she had another egg placed in her by Wazukan that she started to leave their little camp and headed out deeper into the abyss as that giant mound of flesh that only births rabbit creatures... Yeah, and she ends up going all the way to the center, like, near the very center of the abyss, and then uh, Bailoff, in his absolute horror at what he's done and all the guilt, is like, Iram Yui, 
eat me. Literally consume my flesh and just kill me. And uh, in response, Iramui ends up opening a little tunnel for him to go in. And he walks in and becomes the One Punch Man Season 2 CG centipede we all know and love him for. <laughs> he becomes the, the, bo- the CG bone snake. Uh, he becomes Eternatus from Pokemon, uh, whatever Pokemon Eternatus uh, was bla- in. Black and white. Is no, not black and white. Uh, oh, I think no, it's the recent yeah, okay, one. Yeah, no, the Sword and Shield, yeah. Sword and Shield. I, I, I think I got it confused for like Tornadus or whatever. <laughs> um, so this brings us to, well, after, you know, all, all of the villagers you know, offer themselves up to uh, Iram Yui as she becomes uh, Iruburu and uh, becomes, like, the uh, the Golden City. Or, uh, to them, at least, because, you know, the go- there were legends of the Golden City, but, you know, those legends t- turned out to be false and that the Golden City was inside us the whole time. And by us, I mean this little girl that they mutated into a birthing monstrosity. And so they and all she- off- yeah, they, they offer themselves up. They become the hollows we know now. And now that brings us to uh, the, the question I would like to pose. Is Wazukyan the new Bondrude? Did Wazukyan do nothing wrong? <laughs> uh, I would argue that, like... Uh, his decision to eat the children is at the very least, like, I can see the argument for it. And I'm not sure if I would be morally above eating them in the same situation if I was like, I mean, but they're going to die were, anyway. Yeah, if I were shitting myself to death and also mutating into a tree person, like, he didn't have to tell people where he got the food from. He yeah, could, he, he could have kept that shit secret, but he did, he chose not to actively. I guess it... it like, it depends. Do you value the lives of these innocent, uh, like, admittedly completely innocent creatures, but they're going to die in a day versus the lives of these people who are, if they eat the creatures, are going to live for much longer. And, uh, like, once they become hollows for hundreds more years. Well, see, it's it's interesting that you're rationalizing that because that could be a circle back to Bondrude being like, you know, is it so immoral that I take these children and stuff them into these suitcases? And, and told- <laughs> I don't think it works for that. <laughs> well, hey, on, hey, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. <laughs> Obviously, you know, there's a lot more of a, a moral ground to be argued of like these rabbit babies that only live a day versus these human children that could grow up to live their entire lives. They're all orphans. They're all, uh, so like, what the fuck are they going to do? Tell their parents. Ha ha. Um, they're all (laughs) orphans. So they all already, most of them didn't like have much to live for. And so I'm using Bondru's logic and in a way, in the, in the lens of Wasukyan's logic. So like, are these two different, uh, you know, thought processes truly diff that much different. Like at the end, I think they are. When you strip away, when you strip away like the time limits of how long these things can last is the set. Does the sacrifice uh, at the end, do do the means justify the end? I think in Bond Drude's case, definitely not because his end is get to the bottom of the abyss. Well, what does that do other than tell you what's at the bottom of the abyss? It's like you don't need to go down there. Whereas, hey, what, what if uh, what if the that it's the it's the mystery we like it's the human nature to figure out the un what the unknown is. Maybe hey, who the fucking cure for AIDS and cancer is down there? <laughs> who who knows? But there's no reason to believe it's down there. Meanwhile, hey, but with, at the same I, time, I think in the same time, there's no is, reason to believe it's not there. But I think that Wazikyan is a lot more justifiable because, I mean, A, they're definitely going to die, and B, what he gets in killing them is, like, tangible, obvious, we can continue living. Uh, It's not a what if, it's a if I do this, then this will happen. It's not a needless... 
Or let's, it's not as not, reckless of a sacrifice. Let, let us not also... Let us remind ourselves that he only figured that out after t- trial and error. So but, he had to have... But, the, fir- the very first one, he had to like, he had to have... Cu- he did not know off rip that the... Uh, the, the babies would heal the people of the of the squad. He was just like he had to get the idea and he had to put knife to fetus in order to but, make the first one happen. But 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 he did know that okay, this is meat. We can eat this. This will help us sustain living. It is still a tangible this will help us survive. Would you eat a person <laughs> Uh, I like to think I wouldn't, but if I were starving to death in the Arctic and I really didn't like this one guy, I'm not sure if I'd be able to control myself. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't have to die on his own first. It, you're like, it, just because you don't like him, you, you'd kill him first before you ate him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if I'm in a group in the Arctic and there's like 15 people, right? Of course, uh, like... Using rationale, you either choose the fattest or the most uncooperative. Like, it's just logical thinking. <laughs> uh, sorry if you can hear uh, yard work outside, by the way. Um, there was a hurricane uh, at my place two days ago at the time of recording. Well, one slash two days ago. And uh, the, the, a lot of debris needs to be cleared away. So if you hear yard tools buzzing in the background, that's why. Uh, the reason that I bring up uh eating a person was uh two twofold one because the thought has genuinely crossed my mind like only to be like and to just to know just to be like what does people taste like if you if you gave me a death row inmate and they consented to it well act they're on death row uh so <laughs> i don't know maybe maybe their consent need not apply after they've been lethally injected um you know, find get go get me Bobby Flay, go get me Gordon Ramsay, get the <laughs> finest chefs in all the lands, uh, cook them up, Guy Fieri. You know, get a little diver, diners, drive-ins, and dives going at the local prison, and you know, let, 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 let's let's find out what does it taste like. You could say this is related Maybe. to the themes of mystery and discovery in Maiden Abyss. You have this. Uh, like there's this unknown variable of what does it taste like, and you strive for it endlessly. Maybe it tastes like chicken, and Wazzy Cowan just wanted to find out. <laughs> True. So that, now that really finally... was his goal the entire time. Like screw morality, he just wanted to know if it tastes like chicken. He wanted to know, <laughs> can I start the next KFC down in the abyss? <laughs> Kentucky Fried Eremui kids, <laughs> Kentucky Fried children. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so that brings us out of the flashback back to another flashback of uh, Re- when Reg met Faputa and uh, how, well, actually, no, that, that part comes later. Now we're going back to when Reg and Fa- Faputa were meeting outside the uh, the village again. And we see how dedicated Faputa is to her, who the promise that she and Reg made together of and how is so dedicated she is to this promise that she ripped off one of her ears and one of her arms on by herself and hands them to Reg as a bleeding mess just to be like, oh, I'm so happy that you want to f- keep fulfilling my promise despite you forgetting. Now we can eradicate them. And you're like, Chotomate, my friend. <laughs> I feel about, like... Well, what are we doing? All right, so that scene in particular was... Kind of an interesting moment for me because my visceral reaction to that was That's uh, raw as fuck. <laughs> well, yeah, partially, but the other half of it was uh o- almost sort of like cynical, jaded, oh, is this what we're doing now? Like this feels like it, it uh this isn't even me criticizing it. I'll get into why I'm saying this later. Uh which is that I, I was like Oh, this this isn't shocking. Like you, you failed to shock me, and then it hit me. We are at a point in this series where someone ripping off their own arm is just like normal, and I was like, yep, "Same old huh. shit." <laughs> it's a Tuesday. Wait, hold on. Maybe maybe my cynical reaction here is part of the point. Maybe <laughs> maybe this is what the abyss is all about. Maybe I'm falling into this show's trap. 
Uh, and also, Fapita I, eating a bug needs to be a gif. I love... Like, that single shot... There are a lot of cute Fapita like... moments here, which is funny to say, considering what she does in the same arc. <laughs> like, specifically, Fapita eating a bug. I, I need that to be... Is that a gif, actually? I, I need uh, to know. Probably. They, 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 Faputa, I guarantee you the main Nibis fan has gift every cute moment of Faputa. Uh, typing in Faputa bug just gives me, like, ladybug images. Damn. Well, we, we, can, we can sort through that later, because we got more pressing matters, and so do the, the people of Iruburu, because they've, they've got a tiny furry terror knocking on their door. And once a uh, motherfucking reg blows a hole through the uh, the wall to fight, yeah, Juroimo, because uh, he's trying to. What was he trying to to get again? So Juroimo, uh, so Reg came into town with Faputa's limbs, and Juroimo was like, "Value, value, need value." Uh, yeah, and so he sense. attacks Reg, and Reg eventually ends up having to use his. Uh, incinerator in order to defend himself which knocks a hole into the force field around the village which means Faputa is able to come in and, yeah, and, we, fi and we find out what exactly Faputa's deal is and that hurt and which is simultaneously cool and also terrifying to think about that uh, uh, we find out that Faputa is one of the daughters of Iram Yui, and that uh, she was the result of one of the eggs, and that was to bear one final child. And uh, the, the, the thing that makes Faputa special is that she is just, like, in the living incarnation of Iram Yui's wrath made flesh to spare no forgiveness to the people that used her and ate her kids. And she wants to take uses Fapita as a way to get revenge on the entire village. It's a very it's like, interesting idea because she's almost genetically predisposed to feeling a vengeance that she must seek out. Where it's like even later on in the arc where she starts to feel conflicted about killing the villagers, she still feels like I need to take out this vengeance on something. Like it never is like literally her. hard coded into her DNA to fight to kill all these motherfuckers. She's just super angry, mega rabid, uh, hollow child, and uh, she is very fucking intimidating. When she shows up after Reg blows the hole through the wall and the the organs playing, and then she takes that fucking pose with all the lights around her. And that and shot. Okay, so that is one of the shots I was talking about when I was like, there are certain shots from this core that are like seared into my head. Like that, there could have been no more dramatic entrance than that. And I, like that made me so pumped to click the next episode button. I was like, I can't resist myself. Like, I can't if someone wait to told see me, tear into these sons of bitches. <laughs> Like if, so if someone had walked in and been like, yo, uh, Crunch, w we need you. Someone's dying on the sidewalk. We need your phone to call 911. I'd be like, I get out. I need to click the next episode. Can, can they wait 24 minutes? <laughs> yeah, that would have been what I said. I really need to see this furry lolly tear into these monstrosities. <laughs> and, and, and so she does. And it is a bloodbath. So I, I want to take a brief detour to talk about, I guess, the three sort of strands of storytelling that we have in, the, uh, in this block of episodes in particular, which is that the first one is Rico with Vueco, who basically in this block of episodes exists uh, for the most part either to blow the whistle or to hear Vueco's story. But you know what? That's fine enough. She has her purpose in the arc. It's good. Uh, then we have Reg, who is meeting up with Faputa and eventually is the cause of Faputa breaking into the village and, you know, causing all sorts of mayhem. And we're cutting between those two perspectives. And then there's Nanachi. And I'm not gonna lie, I have some problems with how her specific part in this tale was handled. 
So in episode four of the first block, it was revealed that Mitty still alive. Uh, Mitty got cloned, and you you could be cynical and say, "Oh, that's that's just an ass pull." But it's also like, well, we know cloning is already a thing in Maiden Abyss, and like to some degree, it's not entirely unreasonable. I can buy into it. So Mitty still alive, and then uh, her whole deal is that. Rico and Reg need to sort of barter with Bailoff to get her back. At least that's what I thought it would be. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. We don't really know uh, Bailoff all that well, so we don't know how... Uh, I mean, we know one of the things Bailoff wants is human organs, so we already have a reason to suspect that any barter with Bailoff will be very difficult. And Reg wasn't, does end wasn't up... Reg trying to bring... Uh, Bela Fapita's uh, body parts. Yes, it was a combination. Well, the reason why he saw, uh, why he went after Fapita again, if I remember correctly, it was at first just a curiosity of like, hey, that person seems to know me and know about my past. Maybe I should go talk to her again. And then once he was there, he was like, uh, like he requested for her limbs in order to uh, barter with Bailoff. At least that's my understanding of the situation. So there is progress made towards the barter on that front, but it ends up not really being an important detail because Bailoff just sort of lets Nanachi go. He's like, yo, uh, Fapita's back and I feel guilty about what I did for Iremui. You know, I need to confront him again or whatever. Like you're, you're free to go. And he gives Nanachi his memories uh, through uh, this sort of like scent system and makes Nanachi basically inhale this sort of scent that makes her understand all of what Bailoff's been through and what his perspective on the situation is. So we get that done. And then we get to a scene that is honestly kind of frustrating to me, which is the what they do with Midi being back is uh, Nanachi just marks off, uh, like marches off to the basically outside of the barrier because the barrier at this point is like beginning to disintegrate uh disintegrate but still sort of present and so nanachi needs to walk to the very outside of the barrier in order to d dispose of midi you could say and watch her melt before her eyes and you know we get we get the cry or whatever just felt like kind of a weaker version of what we've already been through I don't know what the point I of it was, really. I think what they were going for is, like, Midi being able to say... Or rather, Nanachi being able to say goodbye to Midi on her terms, rather than, like, instead but, of having to, to put her down like she like a dog. Uh, she that could, doesn't make you know, sense at all. say goodbye. Um, I am... I'm not upset with how they handled Midi. I am kind of a little... Uh, disappointed that the whole thing with Bailoff holding her captive because she made the trade uh, just resolved itself, and Bailoff's like, oh, yeah. wait, shit's going down to the village. Um, You're free to go. What I was expecting was that it would be, like, uh, this rather difficult thing because it's like, okay, what does giant centipede monster want from me? Oh, human organs. And I thought there would be, like, some effort Maybe we get a scene of Reg, like, devising the plan, and, like, maybe instead of it being sort of implied that, like, he's searching for Fapita or out of a curiosity, maybe he goes out with, like, uh, like, there's a scene of him thinking it through, like, how do we get back Nanachi? And then he realizes, wait, Faputa, the princess, uh, she has so much value. Okay, I need to somehow get this child furry lolly monster to give me one of her limbs. Is that possible? And we, you know, see him go through all the steps of that. And it'd be tense being like, will Faputa give up the limbs? And maybe it'd be a bit of a plot twist when Faputa is like, yeah, there was this promise we made like all those years back. You remember, don't you? No, I don't care. Uh, have my limbs. And I feel like that would be a satisfying sort of way like, like, if he gave Bailoff the limbs and Bailoff's like, yo, uh, you know, that would be a satisfying enough resolution to the arc. But instead, it, it's just kind of like, yeah, you can go. And then we'll go through what happens in the fourth layer 
just worse and not nearly as emotionally resonant. And like I, I know you said something about like not wanting to put down MIDI like a dog, but I don't really see the difference. Like it, it, to me, it doesn't seem any more peaceful to have her disintegrate from a barrier than to blast her with an incinerator. Like she's still disintegrating and well, melting either way. Like she's dying in the way of like. MIDI straight up won't exist anymore. Like this MIDI is like more of a construct th of than like an actual living thing. Whereas you know, Ananachi was actively making the choice to be like, "Reg, please kill not uh kill MIDI for me." And whereas like she now she's just like making peace with her goodbye without having to like you know put her down. She just she can't keep but living she the the MIDI still fantasy does anymore. put her down. Well, I mean, she doesn't willingly take her out of the ba out of barrier. She knows that, like, as soon as she, she when she leaves to go get to her friends, she can't take Mitty with her. And her th her ent entire thing was that she gave up the journey with uh, Reg and Rico to stay with uh, Mitty, even if uh, like it wasn't you know the the original Mitty. Okay, I think I get what you're getting at, which is that she's like emotionally moving on from Mitty once and for all and gaining the resolve to resist this sort of like dream fantasy of being with Mitty again. Yeah. I get that. But at the same time, I feel like that could have been done without just rehashing the same thing, or at least what feels to me like a rehash. And I, I know I'm harping on this a lot. It is admittedly not a huge part of this arc. But it feels like a missed opportunity, and the scene itself is like, not that she's crying, but I feel uh, cynical about it. And I'm like, well, we did this again, though. A well. And this time it's not a cynical, oh, wow, my, one, my, one of my favorite characters in the show, the, the, the cute rabbit girl is crying, I feel nothing. <laughs> the abyss has made me numb. Yeah, it I'm I mean, <laughs> I'm less disappointed with the exact outcome. I'm just more disappointed with how we got there. Yeah, like, I, I definitely agree with that. Because, I mean, with Mitty, th to be fair, if Mitty's in the picture, there obviously has to be a death scene. I mean, there, there there's no other way to really go about it. But I, I feel listen, like there was Mitty a better was way so to good, do it. We, we, we needed <laughs> Sakushi and Kinemon both knew that we needed to see Mitty too. No, you you, you want to know what really caused Mitty to reappear in Maiden Abyss? Sakushi was scrolling through Twitter, and he saw all of the dark, edgy Mitty memes. And he was like, these are funny, so I want to make more of these by putting Mitty back in the show and give them more can, fodder to turn into edgy jokes. I can, I can easily imagine the, the Mitty in the pot Nindoroid or some kind of figurine like that. And, and you pose it next to a, a sleeping Nanachi. It, it, it sells itself. Uh, yeah. It, it would be cute, save for the context. But it's okay. It, it's all made fine in the end because Nanachi gets a sick new outfit. That That is the one thing I really liked. Well, that and also her dramatic return. To yeah, help how save her everyone. helmet is now like more, can act as a mask and that's fucking cool. It is cool. And it's blue. Uh, and like the blue. Yeah. Uh, I really like that detail. But otherwise, I was pretty disappointed with how Nanachi's plotline uh, turned out. And then we cut back to the village, and Reg and Faputa have the big fight. And this is where the animation uh, shines the brightest in this entire uh, season. Uh, absolutely. This is uh, j just a really well-animated fight. I'm not sure if there's much I can say about it. Just uh, looks good. I think, I, I think my favorite part was when Reg became the throat goat after Faputa just jams her entire arm inside of him and just, oh, like, fucks yeah. him up from the inside. <laughs> like, pumps his stomach. You know, okay, I do actually have something to say about this, which is that I like Faputa's fighting style. Because it's very I distinct. thought you were going to say something like, I do have something to say about this. Uh, it awakened something inside me. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be, that would get me on at least five watch lists. 
Only but five. Only five. Yeah, you know, I, I'm underselling it. It would at least be 17. So, Faputa, her fighting style is basically go super fast, jump super high, and oftentimes literally, like, cut Tear into people. Tear people out from the inside. Yeah. Like, she burrows into people and then slashes at their insides, which is raw as it's, hell. Yeah, it's fucking metal. And I, I especially love, like, all the shots of her basically, like, turning into this white wisp. She's flying around the landscape that quickly, just go, jumping up super high. It's very, very fun to just watch. Like, I could watch Faputa just jumping around to the landscape for, like, five minutes straight with no context. Wouldn't even have to have a plot. I'd just enjoy watching Faputa go everywhere. And her eyes go into this, like, crazy shape with all the lines and the outlines. It's yeah, it looks like cool. her irises themselves are cracking and crumbling. Uh, giving way to anger and vengeance basically looks cool the mo the coolest furry in the world uh yeah fabuta do be the top uh the top tier furry along with nanache we also get flashbacks into uh reg and fabuta's past and they uh, reg is remembering more and more about fabuta as they fight uh, apparently reg we find out Reg, Reg's original purpose was that he had a mission, and he was climbing out, up, out, uh, up out of the abyss to fulfill it. And then he would promise Fapita that once he was done with that, he would return and help Irim, uh, Fapita rather with her quest. Uh, it does. Did he know. Yeah, it does make me wonder if Reg can like clear up the whole amnesia thing with Fapita. Be like, oh yeah, I fired my incinerator one time too many. And then uh, lost my memory, seemingly. I think she's beyond reason at that point. Yeah, but I mean, once she's back to being able to reason, maybe he could clear up the misunderstanding. Like, yo, I fired my incinerator one too many times. I, I flew too close to the sun, Fapita. You gotta believe me. The The one thing about Fapita I didn't understand is how she was able to get those patterns in her eyes, like the green ones that light up that I thought were most similar to... Uh, Reg's helmet. Oh yeah, that does happen. I th I thought there were gonna be like no fucking way is she part robot also, but uh no, I don't think that's the I case. Think I, I think that's just a just... thing that happens to her. I think that it it's just sort of like symbols of the abyss, and they can manifest not just through like robots and electricity, but also just in general ways. So what and you're telling me is that Rico is going to unlock her shonen anime power up? Possibly, she she could actually be a fighting member of the cast at some point. Uh, actually, are you okay? I genuinely missed this. But like, is there any explanation? Oh wait, hold on. No, it's because Fabuta ingested uh all of the like a bunch of members of the of the village and got yeah that's why her that design way. changed yeah okay i remember that now never mind no they were, questions they were offering their value to her because she was the embodiment of value and therefore well when they gave her theirs she uh, regenerated yeah so what happens throughout the fight is so faputa eventually wins against reg Reg doesn't want to kill Fapita or harm her. You know, he's he's being super nice, and Fapita's like, You fool! You were always nice, but it is foolish, and There's she no whips his ass. There's no in baseball. <laughs> and she eventually has, uh, I think, yeah, Jeroimo, uh pin down Reg to stop him from being able to move. He, uh, She just knocks her out. And, you know, uh, roughs him up a little bit. And then she, you know, she's about to destroy everyone. And I, I for, okay, I think this is when Nanachi comes in with Bailoff and, you know, start, starts uh, almost, using her fishing uh, rod. 
Almost, Almost. cuz uh, Gabu does sacrifice himself to protect uh Rico from Fapita. Oh yeah, that does happen. And Fapita's enraged like why the hell are you doing this and Gabu's like yo all right dude chill. Uh Rico right here, yeah, the robot really cares about her. You might not want to do that. He might be a little mad if you killed her. Uh, I you know, he's your Haku and all that and I think that you might lose that if you harm this child. And then he he just collapses and like, oh, I'm dead now. Yeah, I, well, not quite. He doesn't die yet. That part comes later. Uh, that part comes later? When, do you, when does he die? The, the dragon steps on him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How oh, did yeah, I forget he did that? Live an- he, li- he did live for a while longer, only to be killed later. I mean, to be fair, uh, in my defense, there are a lot of people that die throughout this fight in various morbid ways. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he, he is does like get the only his- survivor. <laughs> he, uh, but uh, yeah, he does get his, uh, like the back of the robot gets impaled by a turbinid dragon. Uh, so Nanachi shows up to save the day. Bailoff basically uh, creates the scent as Faputa is destroying him. And he's like, yo, dude, sniff this. And Faputa is like, yo, this smells. Oh, no, what have I been doing this entire time? And she ends up sympathizing with at least Bailoff's perspective of like, oh, he felt terrible about this. They They did not... You know, if they could avoid this, they would have. And Aram Yui, uh, her perspective shifts to where she still feels the vengeance. And she's like, I'll never be able to forgive them. This is just how I am. I am destined to be mad about this forever and destined to want to kill them forever. And, you know, I'm always going to want this village to die. However... I understand your perspective on a cognitive level, and I will be a quasi-ally to you when all the monsters show up, literally all of them, (laughs) to make up for how little exploration of the Abyss was in this arc, I presume. There are a bunch of monsters, all of them, that just show up. We get a bunch of new designs, like uh, this eyeball bird with like four legs. Uh, two turbinid dragons just tag team in the entire village. It's just Mayhem. CGing all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did you feel about the CG once we get to the monster fight? You know, I thought that the CG was as good as you could get for a TV show. Uh, I mean, it is a little distracting, and it's like... Uh, oh, I wish this wasn't in CG. Obviously, ev- like, I think pretty much everyone wishes it wasn't CG. But at the same time, A, the Turbinid Dragon is a very complex design, and I see why those in particular would be CG. And B, like, the- all the rest of the monsters weren't CG. And honestly, I'm just more thankful for that than anything. You gotta take the good I mean- with the bad. <laughs> Like, and imagine this scene w- with just all CG monsters completely shattering your immersion in the world. It's like... Oh, yeah, if they were all It, it would have been a bra I'd... moment. Imagine CG, Faputa. Yeah, at least we didn't have to see CG, Faputa. So count our blessings, because this speaking, book with incredibly Faputa, complex... She, get, she got fucked up. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we we should mostly, I think, just be thankful that this book with complex art, uh, got done in anime the, form, mostly CG. I was gonna say the, the thought not, is coming to you. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> um, uh, as far as the like the rest of the fight goes between Faputa and the monsters. It was almost, like, saddening trying to see, like, get back up again and again, and but just to get utterly out, 
just decimated by the monster getting torn apart. Something that really hit me about the monster fights in particular is that Fapita is shown to be incredibly powerful, like strong enough to beat Reg, which to be fair, that's just because he's, you know, a, a, a nice, a nice shonen boy. You know, he, he's kind, but at the same time, it's also like, oh, but Fapita still beat him. So it's like, you know, we have his unconscious body as proof. Fapita was the one standing after that fight and relatively unscathed looking. And then we see all these monsters from the abyss and they just wreck Fapita. Just uh, by the end, they are throwing Fapita's limp barely alive corpse They're fucking around. ragdolling her. Yeah. Pretty much uh, like it's nothing. Like they're playing a game of catch with it. And really puts into perspective that like this is how powerful the monsters of the abyss are at this point. Like they weren't messing around. Like they they weren't lying when they said hey, from this point forward the monsters of the abyss you don't want to mess with them. Like they make... <laughs> The, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but the spiny monster from the fourth the layer. The orbed piercer, I think. Yeah, the orbed piercer. That sounds right. Look like a uh, They make bitch. that. Look, yeah, they make. It, uh, the terminate dragons make that look completely powerless. The the terminate dragon would probably just blink and destroy the orb piercer. And it would it would all be over for Fapita if. Some of the villagers didn't cut off parts of their bodies to feed to her. Which I thought was interesting, considering she just tried to kill them all a few minutes ago. Well, you, you know, they see her uh, as having a lot of value, and they really want to keep this value alive. They're like, oh, she's the princess. We, they practically revere her. Something I found very memorable and interesting was that when, like, Fabita first reveals herself in the village, everyone's, like, so excited, like, oh, it's the princess. And it, you know, it's like this great moment for them before she tries to kill them. <laughs> and uh, I feel like that scene where the villagers cut off parts of their body in order to nurse Fabita back to health was also meant to sort of mirror what happened way back when uh, when the people on the suicide mission were eating the children of Iramui, and what's basically happening is Fapita's like, oh, they're, you know, sacrificing their own flesh now in order to nurse me back to health. So even you know what? if... I I didn't even think about that. That's really fucking good. Yeah, it's sort of like a, I, I guess it puts her into the perspective of like, oh, this is how they were feeling. Like, oh, if, if I don't eat these, then I pretty much die. And that's and another thing. And she still continued thing. to kill them. Yeah, because her vengeance is just that powerful. But at the same time, yeah, but... it's like she does it with a further understanding, first with Bailoff's memories and then with being in their position. And while unintentionally ending up doing the same thing. Although, to be fair, most of the people in the camp, uh, way back when eating Iremui's children, were also unwitting in their participation in this cruel act, or at least what Fabuta sees as cruel. And, and it, a lot of them do still feel bad about it, which is why a good number of them willingly not only offer up parts of their bodies, but like their entire selves to Fabuta, just so uh, she can live on. And at, maybe also as penance for what they've done to Iremui. Yeah, so, so Fapita, and, and I do sort of like how it's handled that, like, because Fapita is so mad. She has dedicated her life for, hun like, I think 150 years around just trying to kill everyone in this village. And it seems like such a long shot to convince the audience, like, oh, uh, Fapita's on their side now, but uh, through, you know, being careful in how they make her arc uh, end up working, and I guess there was more in the manga that was skipped over, so maybe it was done even better there with the added content, or I guess not removed content, to be more precise, but in the anime, even with the skipped content, 
I think they do a pretty good job of transi- uh, transitioning Fapita from absolutely hating them to still being mad at them and still never forgiving them, but understanding where they're coming from. Yeah, she is able to sympathize with them, if only the tiniest bit, but that sympathy is much just heavily outweighed by her innate desire to just kill them. Yeah. Uh, The impression I get, at least, is that, like, without her genetic predisposition to feeling this sort of vengeance, that she would uh, probably be even willing to spare them. But uh, because she just can't stop feeling mad at them, it's like, oh, well, you have to perish one way or another. She even says, like, uh, I think I have this line. No, I don't have it quoted, but I have it paraphrased where it's like she's going to feed the fire within her. Like, I don't need to ignore this. There's no way I'm going to ignore this vengeance. I can't be on their side. I'm still going to kill them all. I'm just going to do it with a further understanding of their situation. Yeah, she um, she does find a, a shred of mercy where she is willing to spare uh, Majikaja and Ma in order to um, ha- have them help Rico and the gang escape from the-, the crumbling village. Yeah, she does do that. Uh, speaking of Ma, um, that is the true tragedy of this whole thing, how Ma ceased to exist after the village. Uh, th- the scene where Ma like disappears is... like It's so sudden in the way it's portrayed, too. I, where... I hate that is it's like that because like i was i honestly thought for a moment oh my god did ma make it or is ma gonna like join become a member of the cast (laughs) with us i was like oh of course not this is made in abyss (laughs) you we don't get good things Uh, you know honestly with how sudden it was not gonna lie my first thought upon seeing ma disappear was wait did rico take her schizo pills (laughs) <laughs> ma was never like I, I like to imagine Nanachi like as Rico's going like Ma Ma the, Nanachi where's Ma and, like and Nanachi's just like who the fuck are you talking about? Like, no, this, this even entire, worse. Like these past few days, you've been talking about this like f- you've been saying the word Ma. And no one knows what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> no, e- even worse. She takes the pills, wakes up in a hospital room, and she asks the staff worker, oh, "Wait, where am I? What's happening?" Uh, where's Nanachi and Reg? And she's just like, who's Nanachi? Yeah, you've, been, you've been in a coma for five years. <laughs> that would be... Honestly, that would be the most painful twist of them all. Just seeing that the story wasn't real. Uh, Rico Sakushi would died be... in the first layer. and <laughs> she, she died in episode one, and this entire thing was her death dream. You know, if Sakushi did that, it would be pretty much objectively bad writing, but I would give it a 10 out of 10 for the balls. Uh, The experience you had with Ma, by the way, uh, I sort of had, probably not to the same extent, but sort of had with Vueko, because I like Vueko's design and her timid personality is pretty much instantly endearing. I liked her a lot. I knew for a fact that she was going to die. <laughs> As like, no way she's joining the party. Maybe, maybe she'll, li- like, if this were literally any other TV show, she would live to the end. Maybe, like, I don't know, be the sole survivor. Nope. This is made to this. She That motherfucker going to die. I mean, okay, to be fair, I should have realized she was going to die from the mere fact that she's an adult. So there was no way she could join the main party. Because, yeah, y- you, know, S- you know, Sakushi, he needs to torture children specifically. I mean, I get- she, she already filled that quota from her flashback. True, true. And so once the quota is filled, she gets, you know, dispensed of. And uh, in a kind of fucked up way, too, because as she's just uh, trying to run away... She is climbing up a staircase and doesn't realize that there's a hole in the wall and that, that some of the force field is finally sleep, uh, seeping in. And then she starts to turn into a hollow until she is saved by... I'm gonna be real, I don't, I, I don't remember her name. She wasn't the, an important character one. at all. 
Uh, Apparently, honestly, she was one of the original villagers from the uh, the squad, and from uh, that made Iribudu, and was like a friend of Boiko's. Uh, uh, the, her her sacrifice would have hit more if I could remember which one she was from the flashback. Yeah, I don't know who she is. I didn't even piece it together that she was one of the original villagers. I was just kind of like, oh, she's there. She exists, and now she's dead. Rest well, in she peace, also didn't random really have, person. She also didn't really do much in the present di- time. Like, not much as a, the tentacle, the, the turquoise tentacle shopkeeper dude. Yeah. So, uh, Vueko ends up getting pushed down the stairs, and she's, like, just barely clinging to her humanity. Where it's like, she can still think like a human, but has difficulty expressing herself in any meaningful way. And basically, not a fun situation to be in. Uh, Very unfun. Very not swag. And uh, she's able to think that she finally got the horrible punishment that she always wanted, uh, being living long enough to see Iramui co- uh, finally die. Uh, th- that's just so messed up. <laughs> yeah, Waco tries to kill herself like multiple times. Uh, she's like obsessed with this idea of punishing herself. Basically, like, in the flashback, she's literally like, I want to punish myself for doing this to Iram Yui, but at the same time, I can't think of any punishment worse than seeing this done to Iram Yui. Um, I love how she has this, like, air of self-deprecation. Like, she always has them. I don't know if you notice, like, that smile that she has when she's, like, kind of embarrassed or... Oh, uh, like when something when someone says something about like how, like fucked up, the th- the things that were done in the past, where she has this like smile on her face, as she like looks away, it's all it's all wavy and wiggly. She basically completely hates herself and is seemingly glad, at least in a sense, that she got what she sees as deserved on her end. And Wazukan points out that what she was the hood she was wearing the whole time was just someone's underwear. Just to continue continue to put her down. Oh yeah, she wasn't even phased when he said it was underwear. I'm trying to remember her exact reaction. I think I her like reaction was like, some, they told me I could wear it as a hood. <laughs> uh, we get to see the flashback of, of Faputa and uh, Gabu meeting for the first time. I found it very cute how they named each other. That was a very smile-inducing scene. Uh, I honestly forgot that episode 12 was a double-length episode while I was watching it, and then I, I scrolled to the time bar, and I'm like, oh, wait, this is 48 minutes. And it went by in, like, 20, what felt like 24, in a good way. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, like, episode 12 does not feel its length at all. It, you know, it, I mean, this arc in general has been very, very tightly paced, which does make me also wonder about, once again, the cut content from the manga. But, I mean, I do like, uh, I think it's paced nearly perfectly. Like, I can't think of anything, except for, I guess, Nanachi's arc, which that's more of just poor narrative and not really being fleshed out. But otherwise, it's, like, very... You know, like, oh, just no, yeah, the, the right amount of being tightly paced. Yeah, aside from Nanachi's uh, story getting an unsatisfying conclusion, uh, every, th- this entire season was, like, paced perfectly. And so, uh, where are we in the general plot recap? Uh, they're escaping um, from all yeah, the monsters. They're escaping. Uh, was- I like how, as Wazukian is dying... And like saying things like, you know, it's not one thing that drives people into the abyss. It's the accumulation of uh, many feelings that drives people to like escape beyond their humanity and journey into the unknown, into the center of abyss. And when he asks Rico if she's uh, happy to do- have, in spite of everything, to have done the things that she's done, seen the things that she's seen, 
and gotten to where she is now. And she is like immediately, yeah, I'm so happy. I wouldn't change it for the world. And Wazi Khan also has a moment of trying to predict the future where he is like, the only thing down there is just more despair. Your journey is pointless. And Rico just smiles and is like, I'm going to make sure your future doesn't come true. <laughs> no you, L ratio. And then he dies. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, and then he he just immediately, poof, goes back to dust like we all will eventually. Um, so I think it does now make me... we've finally, what, what, what'd you say? Uh, it does make me wonder how much Wazukian can predict the future. And uh, I mean, I, I at least reckon that what he says won't come to pass. But then again, the series is messed. So I wonder who knows if it gets even if it, it could get even worse from here. I mean, it probably will for a little bit. But I like to imagine there's an oasis at the end of it all. Uh, emphasis on like to. Nah, it's just a bunch of dead Rico's mom at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the remaining villagers offer themselves up to Fapita, who uses their value to empower herself, get a cool new design, and finally uses the rest of her power to destroy Iriburu. And from there, they escape, and Reg is like... Uh, so, it, it, it's basically Reg, Riko, Nanachi, and Fapita together, and Reg's like... Uh, actually, I think Fapita starts crying for a little bit. I think probably over, yeah, over Vo Vuiko's death. Because Vuiko, after becoming a half-hollow, eventually dies. Vuiko, uh, and Fapita buries her and puts a, a headstone like, Hey, uh, I heard that the villagers do this to uh, commemorate the dead. And while she's crying, Reg's like, yo wanna join our party, and after a brief back and forth, Fapita's like, I'll think about it. And I'm pretty sure that means a yes in this context. Yeah, pretty, there's There's no way. There, there's no there, way after she, all of that. Yeah, what does she do now that her purpose is fulfilled, and the, her best, essentially her best friend and soulmate is literally right there being like, hey, join our gang. Join our little suicide squad. Yeah, th there's no way she doesn't join their party. She has to. Uh, mega disappointing if she doesn't. I'm, uh, I'm gonna stake a, throw a guess out there and say that she does. Maybe, uh, that's absolutely my guess. Like, 95% chance. Maybe not immediately. Maybe, maybe not, like, as quickly as Nanachi did. Or as uh, Haha Prushka did. But... Yeah, probably, like, sooner rather than later. It's not going to be like, yeah. oh, two volumes have passed and there's still no Faputa on the gang. Uh, the last note that I had uh, before the conclusion is that uh, I found it very interesting that Iram Yui's, uh one of her... I don't know if it was one of the wishes from the Wishing, maybe it was the third one, or just part of her will, that... Uh, the reason Faputa never had any memories of Waco, despite having the memories of, like, her rage and what the people of the village did to her. I did to her mother, specifically. Uh, she spared Waco because she wanted all of Waco, like, existence and memories to herself because she was that precious to her. Because she, she basically was uh, her mother. And, like, even lo loved her even more than her own children. Or, like, or lo rather... Loved her so much that she could not part uh, her memories away, even to her children. Yeah, and that's the reason why Vueco is sealed away in all that black goop in the first place, along with the rest of Iremui's children. Where Iremui is just like, I want mother here. Pretty sweet detail. Did... Is that why she... like it was there? I thought Wazukyan put her there after she tried to kill herself. Uh, I think it's a combination of both, but at the same time, I'm not sure how that would work. 
Because I'm pretty sure, like, the next scene yeah. we see is that after she tries to throw herself off the cliff and uh, Wazukan saves her. Yeah, it's like a smash cut to him imprisoning her uh, down under there. And then she spends the rest of her days just naming all of the the balancing creatures, which are actually, like, the... Were they the uh, the unborn wills of the children that never got to be, or, like, the, the ones that were eaten? Uh, they are the, I'm trying to remember the exact line, but it's yeah, it, it is un. I think it's unborn. Okay. And then Vueco basically becomes their mother. Yeah. So. And we're, the last thing we are left with is Fapta going, everyone, see you later, Sosu. And that brings us to the end of the second season of Made in Abyss. Uh, I... So, it's gonna be a while before we have any more Made in Abyss content. I mean, as far as I can tell, the manga has barely progressed past the point that season two ends at. I think it's like a monthly manga, if I'm correct. Like, there's a new chapter every month, as opposed to every week. Oh, it's it's far longer than that. Sakushi, I think it's supposed to be monthly, but that Sakushi is super inconsistent and presumably a perfectionist. He has a very detailed art style and has clearly put a lot of thought into this narrative that is balancing a lot of different things. And yeah, this is definitely one of the more of all of like the ongoing uh, anime these days. This is a lot emotionally. It's it's a nice blend of emotionally and narratively com complex uh, anime that's airing right now. Yeah, it is. Like it, this series is a lot more narratively dense than I could have ever expected from just the beginning of it, where it seems like a more straightforward sort of adventure story. And yeah, because like you compare it to even contemporaries of this season like your your call of the nights and your licorice recoils like yeah they've got themes yeah they've got stories but there's some of the, they're way more simplistic or way more straightforward and they don't they don't really get the nog and jog in like these ones they don't get your imagination running into overdrive yeah made in abyss is just super super dense uh although i will say uh, so hold on. First of all, what did what score did you give this season? Um, I I was bouncing between an eight and a nine because I I am disappointed with how the Nanachi arc ended up because I feel like like everyone else. Well, I was gonna say everyone else, but Rico didn't really have an arc this season. She just was kind of in the background this time, which is fine. This was a Faputa and Reg story, and and also you know the the flashback. So we had to introduce an entire new cast of characters. I mean, she cut and, her hair. If you want to count that as an arc, uh, you know, uh, uh, sure, dude. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's it's an improvement to the look. Uh, I do agree. Uh, also, I um, checked, and the manga has literally progressed. I think three chapters from where we left off in the anime. So it that is slow can't going. Be right. There's no uh, way. That according can be right. to the wick. No, you don't understand how starved for content Made in Abyss fans are. Sakushi uh, yeah. does not release his manga very quickly. I'm on the wiki, and Hell, chapter 63 make... is the newest chapter, according okay, to the wiki. I'm going to the wiki too. I'm trying to see like where the release dates are. Okay, uh, chapters. Got it. Just instantly loaded me into the comments. Okay. Gift. Gold. Okay. Uh, so that was volume 10 that we have, uh, achieved. And now we are into volume 11. Uh, wow. Okay, so volume 10 came out. It seems they put out a new volume every year? Going off of this timetable? So, Volume 4 After... began publication, uh, like, the first chapter was published in October 20th, 2021, and then there was Chapter volume 62, four? uh, Chapter 61 wa was published October 20th, 2021, 
And then chapter okay. 63, which is two chapters later, and there was also a side story, I guess, was June 30... Well, no, it, it actually has two dates for whatever reason. The first is May 20th, 2022, and the second is June 30th, 2022. TLDR, it is very sparse. These are not... Uh, and to be fair, they do seem like very like rather long chapters compared to your average manga chapter but even still made in a bit like it, it's pretty much a meme in the made in abyss fandom that they're constantly starved for content because sakushi releases at such a slow pace and i presume he's only able to because of how popular the story is at this point okay yeah so ever since volume four there is a new volume every year it looks like uh, and uh, volume five rather, because the volume five came out December twenty sixteen. Then volume six came out July twenty seventeen, and then we switch to yearly releases. We see, uh, next seven in twenty eighteen, eight twenty nineteen, nine twenty twenty, ten twenty twenty one, and the most recent volume, uh, which came out earlier this summer, July at the same time as the anime's premiere, uh, the se- second season, volume eleven, July twenty ninth. And it's only, like, three chapters long. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, they're actually... Almost all of them are released yearly, except for Volumes 4 and 5, which were both in 2016. That seems to be the exception to the rule. Well, uh, alright. Well, we'll see you guys in, like, five years for the season... <laughs> Three, or the unless I want movie. to become, unless I want to become a Maiden Abyss manga reader, which uh, that's a well, pain that's unto itself. Well, that's the thing. Like, not not only will you be subjected to the long wait times, if you, even if you decide to become a manga reader right now, you have three chapters of content to catch up on. <laughs> yeah, you exactly. Are caught up as manga readers. <laughs> so, like, there I, there is truly no winning right now. I don't understand how anyone could survive these types of wait times. Well, I guess you're just gonna have to deal with it. And I guess just like the audience will have to deal with liking the podcast, uh, heading down to the comments so let us know what they thought, and subscribing to the channel. Uh, that is a very good idea. I guess I'll just you, leave off we can... with my my score... For Maiden Abyss Season 2, which is a very strong 8 out of 10. I, I think it's pretty great. I, I, I wouldn't also put it, it an 8. Yeah. I wouldn't put it on par with Dawn of the Deep Soul, just because I think that uh, Dawn of the Deep Soul is just such a an emotionally crushing experience uh, in this package of like an hour 40 minute film of just consistently horrifying you to no ends. And Made in Abyss Season 1, although far less narratively dense, uh, I'm just naturally attracted towards these sort of fantasy adventure-type shows, I- unless they're isekai or native isekai. But aside from that... I would say that, that Season 2 hits... Uh, not. It doesn't quite hit the same highs. I did not... Uh cry during the any scene in uh this season like i did with the midi scene um i did feel horror i did feel the uh the dread of jesus christ what kind of sick concepts is this man cooking up in his brain but i don't think it hits quite the same highs but it also does not hit the same lows as season one like when we had that lull in the pacing and like dealing with an entire layer of the abyss in one episode I feel like this is a lot more consistent of a package. I would definitely agree with that. Uh, As to I, what I, I, I would say the, is the better highs between of season... the two seasons? Uh, it's hard. To, uh, it's honestly hard to say because th- they have their strengths and their weaknesses. I guess I'll go on with why I think season one is better by saying that, like, to me... No no scene in this was ever nearly as emotionally impacting as 
the orb piercer scene. Like anything to do with that, where like all this oh, yeah, pure I guess the, horror the and orb dread. Piercer and the midi scene. And to, the as midi a one two punch. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I would rank season one's a notch higher, but only by a notch. I I think they're both eight out of ten quality. Uh, I would still put season one as like uh, a nine out of ten with Dawn of the Deep Soul. I remember back when I did the Dawn of the Deep Soul cast, I was still undecided as to which one I thought was better. But having some time to reflect on it, I I think Dawn of the Deep Soul thus far is like the peak of Maiden Abyss. And yeah, I, I would consider that like that. a solid nine out of ten right there. And uh, I think that'll just about do her for this episode of Castaway Anime. So if you enjoyed it, uh, go ahead and uh, if you if you want to use us to cope until every year until the next uh, Made in Abyss volume comes out, uh, to listen to a new episode of the podcast every week. Huh? Huh? <laughs> it is a good way to cope with the lack of Sakushi content. How else will we you get to know about things like Sakushi tweeting that the toilet that Rim Jobs Rico at one point is actually a villager and not just a creature of the abyss? It was important that that was made known to the viewer. <laughs> I wonder how many of the replies to those tweets are just, why did you have to tell us this? It, it was, uh, it why was, was this necessary? It, it, yeah, it's a crucial just bit like of world building. that the it, viewers subscribe. It, it fixes got, um, all the plot holes. We've got a banger seasonal uh, fall cast lined up. We will... Uh, we'll have two extra guests on for that and talk at length, probably screaming about Chainsaw Man. Uh, I mean, hey, with four of us, there's a chance that one of us could think Chainsaw Man is mid, so you don't want to miss that debate. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but maybe, uh, if, if it does happen, there, there will, blood will be spilled. So look forward to that. Look forward to Owl House Weekend. That's going to be fun. As we rush to cram Owl House before the third season uh, starts this uh, next month. That's I mean, hey, there, there's very few shows I would rather cram than the Owl House. And uh, that's about it for this episode of Castaway Anime. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Neon Manta. And I'm Crunchy Bagels. And you'll see us next time.